Hello, everyone. I'm Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University. And welcome to the Folks Film Series. Tonight's film, Hold Your Fire, a new film out by IFC Films, who are also co-producing tonight's broadcast. And as you know from watching our film series, we oftentimes feature IFC. They're great partners. This is an incredibly great documentary. Uh, it is timely, it is topical, and it's historical. If you, rarely do you get all of that in the same package. Uh, it depicts a true story, 1973, a hostage standoff uh, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, not far from where I live, actually, uh, at a sporting goods store where four assailants, again, 1973, four assailants trying to rob the uh, uh, sporting goods store in order to get weapons in order to defend themselves against some uh, uh, interreligious gang violence. Uh, it, what resulted was the longest hostage siege and standoff in New York history, and probably among the longest around the world, 47 hours, three hours of which was just a shootout between the police, and there were hundreds of them, uh, and the four assailants who just happened to have been inside a sporting goods store that had weapons, as many as they wanted, automatic rifles, and as much ammunition as they wanted. It was a, uh, a perfect storm of chaos. Uh, they had 11 hostages, uh, initially released two. Uh, one policeman was killed. Uh, one of the uh, four assailants was seriously wounded. And 47 hours later, everyone survived. Remarkable, everyone survived. Uh, of course, except for the one slain policeman. Uh, why? Well, it was sort of the first time, the, the origins of hostage negotiation tactics. It actually started what now we take for granted as something that all police departments have or should have is something that started because of this event uh, in 1973. Uh, De-escalation techniques and uh, uh, all of this was come to bear for the fur ver very first time and a deadly situation was fortunately diffused. Uh, the film and the event picks up on so much of what's happening in our present time, uh, policing and race. Of course, you know, we all have concern about increased crime statistics and of course defending, defunding the police because this film raises interesting questions about restorative justice. If you are watching us live on YouTube, um, welcome, uh, please sign up for our channel. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and if you, uh, and certainly go to folks.org and sign up for our email addresses so you'll have updates over future events. If you have a question for our guests, uh, and we have very special guests. First, we have Stefan Forbes, who is the director of this film. Stefan, I think, is like the, the hottest young documentary filmmaker in the country. He's award-winning, award-nominated. This movie recently received an award from the Library of Congress, only the second film to have received such an award. It's that important a film. Welcome, Stefan. Um, Thank you for having me. And we also have Schweib Rahim. Uh, Schweib uh, was one of the four assailants and he was uh, reputed and was the leader of the group. Uh, all uh, all uh, four of the assailants went to prison. I think one died shortly coming out of prison. One has since died as well. And there are two survivors. And Schweib, who was the leader of the group back in 73, is the lead, still remains the leader uh, many, many decades after. Uh, Schweib, welcome. Thanks for being a guest on Folks. Um, Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, and I would just say that he is actually a leader now in restorative justice. That's right. In helping heal violence in the community and a leader in men trying to have some wisdom and insight into this incredibly violent society that we're all born into. So he's many kinds of leaders and I'm very proud to, to have him in our films and to be able to have told his story. And Schweib, I wanna say, I thought that what Stefan did was incredibly gracious for, for the director to step in again, to make sure that the audience really understands the role that you play now, not just in the film, 
but in our society. Later in the program, I'm going to ask you some questions about restorative justice because it seems like you've been working it for many decades. You started as a pastor uh, in the prison itself as an Islamic pastor, uh, and you have been working in these attempts to create a justice that has restorative elements to somehow seek repair as much as punishment. So thank you, Stefan, for pointing that out. And we'll, we'll definitely get Schweib uh, to uh, discuss this more. I think we should start off by saying, which is something not everyone realizes, the film is set in the very early 1970s, which was hostage crisis fever. Uh, you know, the, a lot of, at that time, it really was, this was, this was, it's not surprising that this thing would became a landmark uh, story because of its hostage negotiation techniques. It became essential because it was not the first. In 1971 was the Attica prison riots that also had a hostage crisis. Of course, the Munich Olympics in 1972, a year later, in which the entire Israel, mostly the entire Israeli team uh, and coaches were killed uh, in a terrorist attack. And of course, a film that Sidney Lumet made famous in 75, an event that took place in 72, one year before the events depicted in Hold Your Fire. Uh, the film was Dog Day Afternoon. Many of our viewers may remember that film. That depicts another true story also set in Brooklyn. That was an armed robbery of a bank uh, that also had a hostage crisis. And they would have very much benefited uh, both in the film and in the story uh, if they had had uh, uh, Harvey with them, Schlossberg, uh, who essentially a year later, uh, out of whole cloth, invented this new uh, police technique. So let me start with you, Sh Schweib. What, what I find interesting from the very start, because it's so um, relevant to some of the issues that we have today with questions of police violence, which is you are a Sunni Muslim and was a Sunni Muslim as long as the, along with your fellow cohorts in 1973. The police really didn't know who you were, right? They sort of thought you were part of the Black Liberation Army, which you were not. And in the film, one of the police said, we didn't trust Black Muslims. And it's clear that the police just had no sense of the nuance among the various communities. Is that correct? I mean, you know, one of the things that you say that I love in the film is you said, you know, we were basically a bunch of squares, right? That we were not militant Muslims. At the same time, you were holding up a, 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 a gun shop in order to get weapons for your own self-defense because the nation of Islam had pretty much put a, a hit out on you for sure. They had already come to attack you in your home. So maybe you can talk a little about this, that you know that you were in the newspapers, you were listed as something you weren't even, that wasn't who you, what you were about. Just like the police didn't really understand uh, the, the nuance uh, difference between Sunni Muslims and the Nation of Islam back then, uh, you know, neither, neither did the media. So they didn't know how to categorize us or describe us. And so they, they, they're as much as responsible for the, you know, the confusion. But no, uh, we were a distinct community. We followed the traditional Islam, uh, Sunni meaning that we followed the practice of the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah from uh, Saudi Arabia, which is the original prophet of Islam to whom the Quran was revealed. But yet the Nation of Islam was a cult-like organization built around the personality of Elijah Muhammad and this person who they called Allah who was another man named Afar Muhammad. Right. Who incidentally, was European, you know, cold, yeah, you cold talk about that when they say in the film, you say when the Nation of Islam speaks of the white devil, they are essentially speaking against their own founder. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, 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 that, so that 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 those differences, you know, it was hard to enter into a debate or even uh, question anything that they may have said. You know, we would be, you know, uh, you know, we were all out there on the street, you know, uh, proselytizing, so to speak, right. street corners, preaching about Islam, and we'd be on one corner, they on the other corner, and when people would ask, they say, "Well, who's Elijah Muhammad?" Yeah, who, say, well, he's who? A, he's, they all look he's the a, same. Well, the other he's thing, a false that, prophet, and that led to them coming over and threatening. The, the other thing that's interesting yeah. is that uh, 
when the, the nation of Islam hitmen came to your apartment, you weren't there, uh, but your wife was there and essentially had a gun and s- scared them off. It apparently took two days for the police to respond to your complaint. So there was a good faith reason why you felt that you could not, def- that the police would not protect you, that the reason you ended up in that sporting goods shop trying to get weapons is because you felt it, truthfully that you were your life and family was in danger. That's correct. That's correct. We didn't, right. we didn't believe they could defend or would protect us. And that's not because we're Muslim, but because we're, we're black. African community. So, so Stefan, l- let's talk a little more about this, the, this idea about the police not understanding who the assailants were because this comes up a lot. They also really didn't understand their neighborhood, right? And this is an ongoing issue that we see even in today's police uh, uh, shootings where you're t- we're told that the police show up to crime scenes. They don't really know the neighborhood. They're filled with their own fear of the neighborhood and their own anxieties. Some of the police in this film make that point that it's not so much that they're trigger happy, they're scared. And they're partly scared because they don't really, you know, they don't, they're not welcome in that neighborhood and they don't understand it. Yeah, it was amazing to me while talking to these uh, officers and really showing them some empathy, wanting to get inside their heads and their community. And I saw that a bit as my role as a filmmaker. Right. Now I'm a white guy. I need to go to my community, talk to us about some of these tough things. And cops don't like talking about race. So it was great that they extended that to me and they spoke from the heart about, you know, they said some shocking things like we were an occupying army. Yeah. Uh, they said we threw the constitution out the window. Yeah. Uh, down, down, the they door, also, down the toilet. They, they said they flushed it down yeah. the toilet. They also <laughs> said, one of them said, my favorite line in the film, Stefan and Sh- uh, uh, Sh- Shag, sorry, Sh- Schweib, um, is when one of the policemen says, Sometimes we overdefine race or racism. Over, right? Isn't that the word he uses? Because we overdefine it as something bad. Yeah, overdefine it as something bad. And he says, often it's just people wanting to hang out with their own people, right? And I thought there was like a, an interesting and shocking comment the saying that we're overusing the word racism because it's not necessarily bad. It means that we just prefer our own kind. And I think it was said to you very casually. I mean, I think you made them comfortable enough to say exactly like what you said, that they threw the Constitution in the toilet. Yeah, and that comment about racism has disturbed so many people that see this movie. I mean, it's very troubling uh, that you know these, the, I felt it was important to put it in because we know that a lot of police feel that way, that yeah. racism is not a problem that they don't need to get to know the community. And that's a problem, frankly, that it's not just the police, it's the country, it's the system we inherited. Yeah. It's a patriarchal, violent, racist country from its inception. It's not, it's not an issue of, you know, is this one guy good or evil? He's pointing to a problem that we really have a lot of work to do in this nation to, to address those things beyond the police. In but, all you know, walks of life. And I'll just say, when you, I saw a killing last week where you see a police officer holding yeah. a gun, it's from his point of view, and he's shouting, put down the knife, put down the knife. And it's a, a, a woman, it's about 20 feet away, holding a knife. She's no threat to yeah. this heavily muscled macho cop, but he does not have the empathy to see her as a human being. But you know, and what this is the essential problem we got to deal with here that that quote looks at and that Harvey Schlossberg would you say- You mean the quote, the quote that says, uh, uh, we overdefine racism. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that quote. Yeah, that we need actually, we need much more empathy than that. And we need communication and listening. And Harvey saw that as a key yeah. way to stop this epidemic of violence. So Schweib has devoted his career, both in prison and outside to listening, active listening. 
you just said, I was surprised what you just said a moment ago when you said this is a country built you know, on racism. Because you know, one of the things that you do so well, oh, Stefan, we lost your video, but you're still there, right? Oh, there you go. Um, one thing that's interesting and so wonderful, the way you made the film, the film is, does not appear to have an agenda or a political orientation. You know, what you just said as the director is not in the film. You know, it's not, what's not in the film is a political statement from the director that this is a racist nation. There's Actually, no it is in the film. I mean, pretty much Al Baker, who is a decorated ESU officer, says we were built. We're a country built on. No, 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 no. But but you it's not the point of view of the film. Some of the right, right. the director. Right. It's not the yeah. point of view of the director. I'm not. I agree. Some of the people openly admit the racism, but what you just said doesn't come across as if you were a cruce, an anti-racist crusader in making this film. Because many people, and we do these programs all the time, Stefan, so I can tell you, we oftentimes see documentaries that don't look like documentaries anymore, old school documentaries, like which recognize that it's a document first and foremost. And yeah, there, there's a lot of advocacy filmmaking out there, which is great. Yeah, on, you, you on didn't do sides. that. You didn't, didn't. Do, right? No, and I think you should be commended for. That's it. why. That's why I, I I I grew to trust him, because I knew that he was going to present my own words, and I also encouraged him to also do the same for everyone else who was there and involved. And so he, you know, masterfully stitched the story together. Yeah. through the dialogue and comments of everyone else. And so, you know, he there is no agenda. It's, it's a yeah. factual presentation of what happened. No, it's and and I, I'm grateful, you know, that for the for the, uh, the the final product. And also, of course, you know, he needs to be get the recognition, man, for someone who stepped back and allowed other people to speak and allowed us to listen from, in, through the through the voices of other people. Well, one of the things that he did is that he, you know, in waiting over 40 years, he allowed a documentary, he made a documentary that actually puts the three parties, the assailants, the survivors or the victims and the law enforcement personnel in conversation without being in the same room. I mean, it's actually a tricky movie. It, it, it's, if you really watch it, it looks like, it looks like they're talking to each other, that they're at a <laughs> diner talking to each other. They're not. They're not even they don't even know what the other one is saying. Absolutely. And it's, it's edited in such a skillful way that in my mind, it really and I'll talk about this later. It is almost a movie about restorative justice because yes. the movie itself, you know, creates this list, active listening, empathy, human understanding. Yes, there are people that say things that may sound harsh, but they also seem regretful when they say it. Right. They acknowledge you do that several times, Schwai. Right. There's no, you know, bitterness about it. There's no cover up in the movie. People are more open as if he's given them permission to speak openly. And they do speak openly and in a way that's I find shocking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that they're, they speak so openly. Let me just ask both of you this question about the set thing. It's the idea itself. An entire neighborhood for 47 hours was totally immobilized without smartphones, you know? I mean, imagine that. I, I think about that. When I saw the movie, I said, wait a minute. People were stuck in subways, in restaurants, in stores, in their apartments. They couldn't leave because hundreds of police surrounded this store. And there was three hours of bullets unremitting. It just fired back and forth, back and forth with automatic rifles, you know, very much like, you know, a horror film for three hours and people couldn't even call each other up to say, I'm fine, but I'm in a restaurant and I can't leave. I mean, this was, these were really dramatic events, right? Yeah, I, I don't think it was a full three hours, but there were different moments in the beginning of the siege, like when they brought the tank in, Yeah, it was very dramatic. But I also wanna just to go back to your last point, you know, I, that was a beautiful thing you said about the film being a form of restorative justice because what we have in our country is a punitive criminal justice system that's about punishing a perpetrator of violence. What many victims actually wish we had was a victim-centered system, which actually held people who do harm accountable, which 
brought them into conversation with their communities, with the harmed party, where a person can ask them questions. Why did you do this? Why? And they can try to explain and apologize and make some reparation. And all kinds of interesting things can happen that victims or harmed parties actually really want. They but, want to hold that person accountable. They don't want them to go to prison and come back to the community, thrown back in with no training or treatment or or a chance to work through what they've done and feel remorse and express it, uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't have a good outcome. And as I made this film, it was a shock to me to learn that, that actually our current system doesn't really hold people accountable. It's not effective in reducing violence. And that, you know, I've always been really disturbed by the fact that our society is so hard for people in conflict to ever really talk. And well, in my films, I'm often seeking to provide a filmic discourse where people who aren't in conversation can actually speak to each other and begin that process of understanding what each other is thinking so we can deal with these conflicts. Right. Well, what also our system doesn't do, because we have a, what's, what is called a retributive system of justice, where we seek retribution, we don't mm -hmm. seek restoration. So it's, it's more than even what you said. It's also truth is not important in our system, like knowing right. actually what happened or for that matter, giving people a chance to tell their story, right? So, you know, we don't even know these options. I mean, most people don't realize that the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission after apartheid was designed for this purpose to accomplish what Hold Your Fire does in, in, its micro, in a microcosm. Uh, yes. Even wow. even in Rwanda, you know, wow. these systems of truth to TRCs is something that Americans find very, very foreign. And that's why I wanted to make sure that by, before the end of tonight, that Schweib talks about his work in restorative justice, because most Americans don't even know that's an option. And I think you did a very good job right now of explaining that. Um, can we talk a little about Schlossberg? Uh, so I find the whole thing improbable. <laughs> Here's a guy who's a traffic cop who happens to have a PhD in psychology. You have this extraordinary hostage situation in Bushwick, Queens, very volatile, very tense, a powder keg. And the commissioner of the police calls Schlossberg. It's not like Schlossberg is already in the, in the, in the uh, uh, developing his own unit within the police department to deal with the tactics of hostage negotiation. He basically invents this on the fly. He invents it in real time. I find it so extraordinary that the police commissioner said, there's a guy named Schlossberg, <laughs> give him a call, bring him over. He has a PhD and maybe he can figure out how to get us out of this without too much blood. Is that really what happened? Not exactly. Harvey had been doing trainings at Floyd Bennett Field with brass, with, you know, captains and above. It was very much in its planning stages. Okay, Harvey, good. They knew who he was. Harvey's still working out his theories. He's teaching this class. And when it comes time for the final exam, this situation pops up. <laughs> this became the final exam. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you can't train cops or it shows that this training doesn't work and they're still too violent and they're still racist and nothing will ever change. And it, actually that's not true, but what you do need is training coming from the bottom up. You know, you need people, everyone trained, but you also need the will from the top down to enforce that. And what you saw with the commissioner was, he said, hold your fire, I'm gonna do it Harvey's way, no more shooting. And Police departments are paramilitary organizations. They follow orders. So if the directives come from above that this is the protocol, you know, if, if something happens in New York and they don't call in the HNT, that captain is going to have to answer to the commissioner because there's a protocol in any hostage situation. But, but there was resistance, right? Because in your film, mm. we have oh, yeah. who say we didn't like the commissioner because we thought he was a little bookish and cerebral and soft. And he's the kind he of guy panty that- panty waist. Yeah, panty waist, right? He's the kind of guy that would call a Schlossberg in, right? And yet we, you know, we think that's not how do you resolve these disputes. You go in guns blazing and you basically take no hostages 
and you open fire, right? So what was interesting is what you're saying is they took direction reluctantly. Well, they always do, but this has to come from the top down. There needs to be a commitment. And the NYPD commissioner right now, key chance to expand this beyond the negotiators. Every law enforcement officer in America who carries a gun needs this training. That's our message. That's what we're trying to put out there because yeah. a situation can pop off way too fast. Cops should be voices of diffusing conflict, of, of showing respect to everyone. The stuff that Jack Cambria oh. is out there training them in. But it, it, this is not just for a hostage situation. It's for every interaction that a cop has. It's going to save lives. And the NYPD, when they started doing this, looked like a thought leader. It's a win-win for any mayor in America. And so, we're trying to get the word out there. Well, I was just going to say, if the Portland Police Department called you tomorrow and said, would you and Schweib come out, have a screening of the movie and a talk after you, would you be willing to engage in that kind of crusade where the two of you actually take the film on the road? If he will, I will. <laughs> Because I actually think it's a great idea. Have police well, we're departments. Talking, we're talking to people across the country. In California, they showed excerpts from the film at the statewide hostage negotiators uh, convention to thousands of people. And with this horrible event up in Buffalo, this racist, violent attack, guess who's going there next week? Jack Cambria, former leader of the hostage team in New York. He's going to show them the entire film wow. and use it as the basis for their training. And these are the guys throughout New York State. This is where this horrible massacre took place. The NYPD is already acting to use this film to educate officers and spread the word. So it's already happening. Schweib, did you ever meet when you were finally released from prison, uh, Schlossberg? Now, I should tell the audience that Schlossberg probably would have been here if he had been alive. He just died last year, right? So yeah. he, he plays a you know, significant role in the movie. Um, and, you know, of course, it's his techniques that are the, is, is the origins of, of, this, uh, of, of the negotiations. But it's really, it is sad that he never got a chance to see the final, you know, Stefan Forbes result. Uh, Schweib, did you ever meet him? And did no. I, mean, I think it's an interesting thing, you know, in a way he saved your life. I never met him. I didn't even know anything about him. Never heard his name until Stefan approached me about this documentary, what he was doing. He, he wanted to interview me. He wanted me to tell my side of the story and why we were there. And I, I first time I ever heard his name. He told me, you know, he told me about the book. Uh, I, I went to buy the book. And by the way, that book is very, very expensive that he wrote because it's limited printing. I see. You know, if you, it's over two hundred dollars for that book. You know, I mean, so I eventually bought it, you know, and I read his, some of his thoughts and ideas, you know, but I never got a chance to meet him personally. But I did meet his wife uh, and um, and his daughter. So, Stefan. But, and I and I did say in the film, because once he told me, I realized you know, this man was really, you know, the engine, because I didn't understand. I remember where we were inside the store. I didn't know why they had stopped fighting, shooting. Uh, you know, I was glad they did, because they were really in the beginning trying to just come in and kill everybody. Uh, so the fact that they had stopped, they had restrained their fire, I didn't understand why they were had restraint, they were practicing restraint. I didn't understand why they didn't storm the store after, the, you know, the people inside the store was able to find their own way yeah, out. That is one of the extraordinary pieces, right? That even after the nine hostages were released, Schlossberg directed the police not to storm the store on the theory that, no, we're going to have everybody survive. Everyone's going to survive, not just the hostages, but the assailants as well. And that must have made no sense to a lot of the policemen, because let's not forget, there was a dead policeman. And we know yeah. from television police, police procedurals, and we know from reading the newspaper, when there is a dead policeman, all bets are off. The police, the blue wall and, you know, blue power comes to the fore and it's about yeah. the loss of a brother. So I found the fact that 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 happened here very extraordinary that he that that is, yes, top down, Stefan, but still with a dead cop, you would have think once the, the hostages were released, people would have just it just rushed in and all guns blazing. 
Yeah, and you know, another super surprising thing when I made this film, and we really started to delve into what happened, you know, and these, these men, Shuaib and Dawood, spent the last 50 years being demonized as cop killers on yeah. the front page of newspapers. You know, I started to ask, well, you know, Officer Gilroy is hiding behind a pillar that's very, very wide, and he's a trained elite policeman, you know, and he's looking, peering out over the side. He's looking at the store. He didn't get hit in the front of his head. He got hit in the back of his head. And, you know, he's not probably going to let the back of his head come out this way. He knows where the store is. So I started to say that high-ranking police officials, you know, why didn't you find that bullet? And they said, well, we always find the bullet. And you know what that means? You know what I'm telling you? And I would say, yeah. I think I know what you're telling me, that it, it, it could be friendly match. fire. It so, didn't but, match with anything. But, 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 but what's interesting... I'm sorry, is, I'm sorry, Shuai, should, should what were you saying? I said, it. it didn't I, we match. believe that it, that it did not match with anything, it did match any, any gun that was inside the, the wound, store. Right, the wound right. itself. But, but it's one of the things I wanted to ask about this, because, you know, the film suggests the possibility of friendly fire. Now, what so did the jury. The jury suggested it too. Yeah, so... They came right out and asked the judge about it. But if, in fact, I mean, I could imagine that there would have been an order for a new trial if the uh, evidence, forensic evidence, would have... You don't think that forensic evidence well, would have said... Well, I could tell you the politics after we they got the conviction... Uh, it was like a railroad justice, you know, the judge just kept this much dismissing our objections and everything. I ended up having to defend myself. Oh, that's another story, the whole trial itself, because I ended up defending myself with. Uh, so you're saying the evidence of the, the fact that there was no bullet and it right. was not it was an uncertain who I understand that eventually the charge was manslaughter. So in an and, and felony kill. murder and felony murder and felony murder, of course. Yeah. Right. But and, not, and the felony murder it didn't really matter who. Fired right. Shot. It didn't matter. Right. right. But I mean, I think that's an important point that they didn't seek the maximum because there were questions here about the reason it was manslaughter. They, was he could have, he, the judge could have had ran all those charges, what they call wild, or we say a concurrent. Meaning that when you finish one, then the next one, the next. Yeah. People would have died in prison. They would have never been paroled. Right. But he deliberately brought the cases together, charges together consecutively. Yeah. And the pro probation department, who did the background check on us and knew me after interviewing every my family, recommended that the judge not sentence us uh, consecutive, but concurrently to give us a chance at parole. I see. And that's what happened. Hey, that's Stephon, what happened. Stefan, well, one of the things that I wanted to ask you a moment ago. So how did you find this material? You're a young guy. I'm not sure you were born in 1973. Um, how, you know, uh, Schweib is- I'm not that young, brother. <laughs> yeah, you know, I told the audience, you're the youngest hot film documentary filmmaker in America. Yes, he is. He's uh, he a man, that's a professor. I call him the professor. I call him the professor. I, I mean, I just think that this is a story <laughs> that is not well school. known. This is not like Kitty Genovese. This isn't even like Dog Day Afternoon. It's not widely known. Hopefully it will be widely known. But how did you find this material? A friend of mine just mentioned, hey, there's this amazing uh, cop. He, he helped catch Son of Sam. You know, we had all these theories, you know, said, wow. Yeah, he even invented hostage negotiation. Really? I said, did anything really dramatic ever happen? He said, nah, nah. I, 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 he has a book out though. I said, is it good? He said, yeah, it's all right. So I got the book. I opened it up page one, you know, on January 19th, 1973, four armed gunmen broke into a store. I said, what? This is the greatest story ever told. This is French connection. This is Dog day. This is Serpico all rolled into one. Yeah. You told me there's no story here. Yeah. So I instantly got sucked in. I just set about trying to meet these guys and find out what really happened because I had a feeling we didn't know the whole story. So, so does the movie take a position? Because again, so many people are saying interesting things in this movie. Um, sometimes statements against interest, but they're honest and there's empathy to them and there's a sense of sincerity in what they say. 
But one of the things that isn't clear to me is maybe it's because it goes to a deeper, uh, a deeper point about the American soul, which is why, why do police prefer to not negotiate until this moment in time, not negotiate, storm the crime scene? I mean, every episode of Chicago PD has several scenes of the police armed, you know, busting down a door, right? And it just seems like it's part of the American motif that that's, that's what we understand. There are very few hostage negotiation films, you know, and few, fewer that were successful. And I wonder why is it, and remember when police do not negotiate and open fire, storm the scene, they're undertaking great risk, right? You'd think they'd say, you know what? <laughs> Maybe what we should do is wait for the hostage negotiator. Maybe we should slow this thing down because Schlossberg is talking about this idea of, you know, stripping the emotion out of the anxiety, right? The anxiety or the panic, the impulsivity of the police is caught up in the moment. And if you slow it down, better, better outcomes are possible. Why, why do you assume that it took Schlossberg to invent this and is it still, doesn't still seem to be the preferred outcome. It doesn't seem like the police want this. It seems like they still want to do what you see on television. Even when it's a risk to them and their lives. Yes. You know, and I think Shuaib can talk to this too in the work that he does uh, in the communities. But, you know, it's not a surprise. We're socialized to believe that it's through domination and often redemptive acts of violence that we define our manhood. We've been seeing this in Hollywood for a hundred years, you know, it, it's very cinematic. You mean like, you mean like a, the cowboy and Indian Western is like the sure. perfect example of that went on for decades. Sure, and cops feel very constrained. Like the American notion of masculinity is sick. It is ill, it is unhealthy. It physically makes people sick. It gives them heart attacks and stress and, and high blood pressure. Cops have all kinds of health problems because they're trying to live up to this macho image that Al Shepard from the NYPD talks about, John Wayne, you know, these heroes, these macho guys that they have to dominate a situation. And the law, they'd rather die than right. slow down and talk and seem weak or seem vulnerable or seem like they used words. Still, American men are trapped in this, in this you know, really destructive box, the man box that we put ourselves let, let, in. Let me tell you, in prison is where I learned how to uh, de-escalate. Prison is, New York State prison, I was in maximum prisons of over 37 and a half years. It's the most dangerous place in the world. You have some of the most dangerous individuals right there around you, day in and day out. If you come into the prison system like you want to be this tough guy, want to create you know, this image of yourself, you're not going to last long. You're not going to survive because everybody in there is, is, has, has already committed some act of violence and they're not far from recommitting it. And so most of the men in there, man, for the most part, I found that they'd rather be left alone. They would rather uh, survive and get, one day home, go home to their families. But if they feel threatened, even a little bit, by another prisoner, you know, they will explode with a level of violence unseen out here in the street because it's all the frustration, anxiety, yeah, yeah. and stress that, will, that, that they will unleash. I've yeah. seen it happen. I've seen it happen well, on numerous occasions. So I came to realize that, you know, when there was a confrontation, between, and I was the imam, the, the leader of the Muslim community. And if we had a confrontation with an individual, it more than likely became a group, one group against another, whether yeah. it was the, the Muslims, the gangs, and the, you know, against each other. And I realized that, you know, it was better if we could sit and talk to one another. And so I, I, I did this on my own, tried to, tried to diffuse the situation through conversation. And I began to realize that you know, most people had the same common interest. Nobody in there had a suicide. Now I'm saying nobody. You know, most men in there didn't have a suicidal, uh, 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 you know, ideation in, in, in on their mind. They didn't want to kill themselves or be killed. Right. They want to survive from one day to the next. And if everyone wants to survive one day to the next, well, how can we how can we resolve whatever the difference may be without us killing each other? And so I find out just by using common sense 
negotiation, communication, was able to save a lot of lives, both amongst my community, as well as other men who are non-Muslims in the community, because so, nobody really wanted to go out there. And the police, they observed it inside. They said, wow, you know? So the Muslim community was very well respected because we always took a more nonviolent approach in the beginning, always. And the key you words know? are to diffuse and de-escalate. To diffuse, to de-escalate, and de-escalate. to communicate, uh, uh, communication, and also reconciliation. If there's yes. some kind of way to repair the harm without a lot of people going to war, and that, that's the path we chose. Right. That was instruction from our religion, too. That we'd always take, if there were two extremes, you always seek the middle. And that, that's another point that I think is something that Stefan said earlier, that the reconciliatory impulse really doesn't exist at all in our legal system or a, apologetic discourse, right? I mean, the language of I'm sorry, you know, they've had studies that show that 30% of all medical malpractice cases would disappear if the doctor simply visited the patient and said, God, I am mortified by what happened. That is just not what I expected. That is not the outcome. That doesn't mean that the insurance company won't write a check. They'll write a smaller check and they'll, it'll, be, they'll be a, it'll, it'll result in an overall better outcome. But it's, we live in a country where the insurance carriers literally prohibit the doctor from even talking to the patient. So again, the, the, the very thing that Schweib has been doing, which is getting parties to sit down and talk to each other is not really what we do in the United States. One of your policemen, Stefan, I think says we're a violent country. I think he says he's flat out. He says, look, let's just face it. And, and I, I think that, and, and that's why the police overreaction is not, unless what we're seeing in the post George Floyd era, where we're starting to see this relationship between race and, and policing and, and the disproportion uh, uh, responses to African-American or Americans and people of color. But I think there's the general impulse of overreacting is how you can describe so many of these scenes, right? That that word is always common to all of these crime scenes. I, I, but let's go back to the police procedurals for a second and again, it's not just that the, the police, it, it, it's not in their best interest to storm the scene. It would be better to slow it down and, 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 and dissipate the anxiety. But it's also, I'm saying dramatically, the, the standoff is more dramatic than the shootout. I mean, that's why I'm saying that when you want, your movie is riveting, <laughs> you know? It's, it's actually riveting, even though we know what happened. It's a riveting movie. And by the way, you were, your instincts, too. Your instincts are right, Stefan. If someone had made a feature film out of this, like Dog Day Afternoon, it would have been riveting, even though it would have had a lot of waiting around patiently trying to diffuse the situation. And that's why I'm wondering, it seems to me that there's something even in the audiences, uh, there's something about America, like we insist on immediate gratification. Or we like violence, you know, we like football, we like gladiatorial contests, we like contact and, and, and sitting around waiting for the other side to calm down is not, not a, it's almost anti-American. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. That's, a, Amen. that's a provocative thing to say and I'm letting you guys- Cause they're waiting, they're waiting to, to see, you know, what, what's gonna happen. It's almost like a, Moments, it's like a pregnant moment. Something's getting ready to happen. You get the birth is getting happen. <laughs> but the outcome was what no one expected, and yet everyone truly wanted was a peaceful outcome. And yeah, uh, and, and it's a lot harder to make a dramatic movie about anxiety, about tension, about <laughs> yeah. trying to work it out and missed connections. That can be you know, have you on the edge of your seat, but it is so hard to do. And we worked with our composer, you know, Jonathan Sanford, my buddy, John Beasley, an amazing keyboardist who toured with Miles Davis, Grammy winning guy mm -hmm. to create a musical sense of anxiety, to create a soundscape, to put you on edge. You know, it, it's much harder to do. And that's why Hollywood often doesn't try it because it is simply the, the filmmaking, uh, techniques are just so much more subtle and difficult and it can fall apart at any moment. Uh, but I didn't have the luxury of massive amounts of violence, so I had to do it the hard way. And, I, and yet, one reason it took so long. Seven years, seven years. So, so let, me, <laughs> let me ask you this question. Seven years. 
Yeah, wow. it's a long, but but it but a riveting out a, a, a riveting product. Ninety five okay. minutes of riveting. I yeah. mean, I when I first saw it, the finished product of what he got, and I and I looked at it, I was on the edge of my seat. Yeah, my and you knew the story, <laughs> and I knew the stuff. But I, you know, I did. I learned a lot about other people. I didn't know what the other people felt or or, or, or certain. Well, he didn't share that with me. Yeah. I saw for the first time on film. Yeah. the conversation. I said, "Wow, yeah. I didn't know that happened." You, oh, what, yeah. here's what the police were thinking when yeah. and when I at, when that. I was thinking this. This is what they were thinking. Let me ask you this. Here's a tough question in this age of racial sensitivity. If Schweib and his buddies were white, how much different would this film have been? What would what, what would have happened in Bushwick in 1970, January of 1973? Four white oh, guys. I could, I could take that one easily. Yeah. I mean, first of all, the cops never would have felt that they were members of the Black Liberation Army. So there wouldn't have been that level of fear. Because remember that I think it's important for the audience to know the Black Liberation Army avowedly said we hate the police and we want to see dead police. Right. That was the point. Right. We want to create dead police. They yeah. <laughs> were in many occasions uh, ambushing and, and assassinating them. Right. But we see on a deeper level just because of the dehumanizing that America had to do to justify slavery. We've had 400 years of dehumanization. So it's hard for a lot of white people to fully see a person of color as human and to fully have empathy. And we see cops going to great lengths to avoid shooting white criminals. Even when a guy's waving an assault rifle around. Mentally Look what Ill happened guns. in Buffalo. Look what just happened in Buffalo. This man killed 10 people. He walked out of the store with the police. Now, the scratch on him, they didn't throw him to the ground. They didn't brutalize or beat him up. You know, they, you know, they probably gave him ham, stopped off and had hamburgers with him at McDonald's. You know, they treated him like a human being. They was almost empathizing with him. When they, when he, that was, that was the, the most uh, uh, undramatic arrest of a serial killer. <laughs> but a black person killing one person or even threatening to kill one person. Oh, my God. You've seen it. Let's look at the difference. Wow. You know, here's a man was a known killer. He had already told the police months in advance what he was going to do. They had mm -hmm. even had encounters with him when they saw him in the community, casing him out, you know, these stores. And he was he was in Buffalo for, for months planning this, you know. And yet when he when he committed the act, you know, the police, the expression, it was almost like, you know, they were arresting their nephew. Or they their ushered son. him out, you know. But I no. do want to say again. This That's film is privilege. not about. That's called white privilege and white yes. supremacy. Yes, and this film again is about getting beyond these binaries of black and white, good and evil, and to not blame cops alone because that lets white people off the hook. Oh, I have nothing to do with this. It's just the cops. No, they're doing what our society asks them to do, Very and they're good. doing it according to four hundred years of domination and violence. So we pay their salaries. We need to stand up and have the kind of society we want. It's incumbent on everyone to not demonize the cops, but to look for solutions and to act. Act to reform our society. Here's a tool. Share this film with your friends, with your loved ones, because this film can make change if we demand that our mayors and our police chiefs give this training in empathy, in listening, in conflict, de-escalation. And that we have a solution. We've had it for 50 years. We just didn't know. So, so, so let's act. So do you think that given what you've both just said, that for people out there during the Black Lives Matter protests who talked about either defunding the police or suggesting more community policing or suggesting um, more social workers being involved, do you think that this film gives a person a perspective as to why those ideas might be useful? Do you think yes. that, the, do you actually think that if people who don't understand what, I don't even know what it means when you say community policing. I don't know what it means when you mean social workers. A lot of people, you know, have been joking about that. They're saying, what are they talking about? You can't fight crime with a social worker. Is this film a kind of an exhibit A to say, look, this doesn't answer every question, but just be, be impartial and watch the movie. Don't be upset, just watch the movie. And maybe then you might understand what we're talking about. Do you think that this movie does in that way 
Speak I pray so. I hope so, because this is what uh, the people who have seen it thus far that I know, members of my family, who didn't, many of them weren't even born yet. You know, they saw this whole story. They, they got a much better and deeper understanding of what happened. And some of my other friends at my job who was able to see it. They saw it and they have, and they're social workers. They came away from it with an understanding. Of, wow, that actually happened almost 50 years ago. And they're not doing this anymore? Why, why aren't they doing this? Why, why isn't this standard? And so now the, the, it'll raise the question because this film shows that it works. So, so what I'm saying, Stefan, it, 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 Schlossberg did this in police departments and you're describing the development of these techniques within police departments. But is this also sort of what people are talking about when they say social workers? In other words, no. Schlott, is that something else? Do you know? Because I can see someone saying, oh, I see, this is sort of what they mean by social workers, where the work that's being done within the police department is not combative, it's not violent, it doesn't involve guns, it involves talk as a way to diffuse the situation. Or are defunding the police mean, yeah, not the police. Someone not like Harvey, someone who has no credentials in the police it's, department. The, the, the number one message that comes out of this film, for me, that I've seen from Dr. Harvey Schlossberg, was his statement at the end, human life is a precious thing. Human life is a precious thing. So our police departments have to understand that their number one objective is to preserve and to protect life, all life. So if they go into a situation with thinking of a way in which to calm the situation down, diffuse the situation, you know, without causing further harm and definitely not taking the life of another person, you know, if they come with that reproach, with that philosophy as their foundation, then the outcomes will always be different. They will always be more successful and peaceful. You know, so it's not a question of social work. It's a question of a philosophical foundation where you look at all human life in this, through the same lens. Right. And this is another thing that even even Jerry, Jerry, Jerry Riccio, he said when he walked out of the store, he could have walked away. I wouldn't have been able to stop him. I wouldn't have yeah. tried to stop him. He yeah. said he came back. He said when he was asked later on by the police, he said, why did you go back? He said, he said, man, because there were people in there. He said, no, they, you know, only everyone in there was a minority except for uh, 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 the, the woman who was in there. She was the only one that was in there was white. Everybody else in there was a person of color. He said, why did you do it? He said, no, 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 they're not. Uh, minorities, they're human beings. He yeah. said, I'm not going to abandon a human being. But, so that mindset of looking at another human being as a human being, yeah, and not as uh, an enemy, not as an animal, not as some kind of perp or some kind of mark, but these, all these other terminologies that they use. That's the first thing they do. They, 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 they label you and, and, and dehumanize you. So therefore, it's easier for them to kill you. Well, it's interesting that you said human, that Schlossberg thought in terms of human being. But yes. I think there's a shocking moment in the film, especially given the times in which we live, when we realize that the police report used the N word. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That, I, I'm giving a big, transcript, a big that... reveal, Stefan, but it's an amazing, an amazing moment. You're realizing how, unapo a... how unapologetic it was that the police defined this as using the N word as here are the people, the people that were in the store, the N word, uh, right. in the police report in 1970. Oh, they had 911 transcript, a 911 transcript, a radio communication between yeah. the police speaking to each other. There's a transcript of that communication. And, and, and not Birmingham, Alabama, but Brooklyn, no, Brooklyn New, York. New York. Right, very, very, think about <laughs> this is Brooklyn, New York, you know, post-civil rights era, 1973, we've had the, Civil Rights Act, we've had the Voting Rights Act. This is this is a blue state, right? And I, I mean, I found that shocking. Again, if it was Birmingham, maybe, but not New York City. Um, what, before we take some questions from the audience, I, I have one maybe final question for the both of you about emotion. Not surprising, there's a lot of it in the film. Uh, on cops and assailants and victims, everyone is, you know, very revealing. <laughs> in every way possible, which I think is a credit to Stefan, yeah. Stefan's film, that he gets them to reveal so much about themselves. He got me to do the same thing. I was just <laughs> gonna say to you, I looked at you and I said, this must be freaky for you to watch the movie. You don't even look the same. 
You know, it's like you looked like a little boy. You were a young man, but you looked like a boy. And we know from this, it's heartbreaking. We know why you were in the store, right? We know why you were in the store and you get, you know, all those years were lost. I wonder whether, I mean, can you just share with us briefly what that's like for you to watch this film? Because you're really the, the primary subject matter of it. It's triggering for me, you know? It brought back all the memories of trauma to see it on, on film, uh, these footages of myself, my co-defense. We were young. I had my 23rd birthday in the holding pin in the Brooklyn House of Detention. You know, so I, we were all young. We was in our early 20s. And so yeah. this was, the, to see this picture back, seeing my mother, oh my God, hearing yeah. her voice, he captured the voice. All of that just, it, it broke me down inside. You know, it again, brought back a lot of, Grief, regret, remorse, you know, the wasted years. Uh, if I could have, would have, should have had, you know, things that had been played out. Of course, you know, I'm much wiser now. I've studied so much since then. And, you know, that's something that, you know, I, I regret and I'm ashamed of. A lot of people ask me, say, you know, yo, that was exciting, exciting. That was the worst day of my life. Yeah. <laughs> the worst three days of my life. Yeah, no, you it's it, it was and, very, you, you, you were, you, you're such a compelling subject in this film. Schweib. I mean, truly compelling in every way possible. And I, mm. I couldn't resist asking you this question because it, it seemed, you know, that there, that, that you, every emotion that you could pop, what a human being could possibly have is revealed in this movie with you. Yeah. Let's take a couple questions or at least one from our audience. This comes from uh, Ellen Saxstein, who says, during the standoff, I guess this is for you, Schweib, uh, did you ever consider releasing the hostages that may have increased your chances of survival? In other words, was there a thought that you should release the other nine or did you feel as the movie describes that the hostages were leverage and that you probably felt that if you didn't have the hostages, they'd come in and kill us? No, that never crossed our mind. You know, when we were, we were leaving the store with the weapons out the back door. The only people we had with us was Jerry Riccio because he knew the way back there in case it didn't need the key. And the co-owner who was uh, Samuel yeah. Rosenblum. Those are only two. Everybody else, we had tied them up and left them inside to yeah. keep them from getting to the guns while we were leaving. So they were never considered hostages on our part. When we came back in, we untied them. They were firing shots through the front window. Talking about the police outside. They were still shooting. The door back door was closed. They were still shooting. And we said, oh my yeah. God, they got these people in here. So I lined the people up in front of the store. I, I, I tried to open the door. The door was locked. We didn't know where the keys was. And boneheaded move on my part. I shot the front window out. And that started the barrage. And, just, and I was telling them, there are people in the store. Yeah. And that just opened up a barrage yeah. of, of shots. And then we, we, we protected them. We hit them up, told them to go hide yourself away from them. They were not tied up. We didn't consider them hostages. We didn't consider, we didn't try to negotiate for them. Many of, you know, a few of them, they were all people of color, except for one, from one woman. They were right. dark, dark Latino and, and, and African-American. You know, so Stephon, we were sending them out. Yeah, I thought would have exposed them to danger. You would have said, right. You're saying we didn't do that because it's interesting, Stefan. I hadn't thought about this, but like Dog Day Afternoon, the assailants here, never had an interest in having anyone harmed, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't, I love what Schweib just said. We didn't think of them as hostages. Everyone else thought of them as hostages, but we didn't exactly. see them that way. We were, we were not looking to have them in harm's way. That is what that Dog Day Afternoon has a lot of that feeling that the two bank robbers really don't want to see harm uh, come that's, to how, that. that's how that's uh, how uh, Jerry Rico was able to get them out. Jerry Rico came to me, the, but they were on the bottom floor. Yeah, the windows were shot out. This is in January, 23 degrees outside. It, it was freezing inside the store. They were covering themselves with the with the merchandise, and people were shivering down there. They were afraid. They were afraid of us too, because we had these guns. And whenever we walked near them, I, I, I spent hours talking to them, and they, and they testified as a trial. You know, that we talked to him, calmed them down, told him we wasn't going to hurt them. We had no, you know, he said, listen, the police are shooting at everybody in here. 
We right. have no way of communicating. We had already cut the phone wires in the beginning so no one could call the police outside. So there was no way to communicate. And so there was a communication breakdown. You know, the people were stuck inside the store. I realized these people hadn't done us no harm. And I made every, gave them every insurance. We had no intentions of harming them. And that they, we were trying to get, you know, in this situation. But everything that we were doing from inside was being misinterpreted outside. Yeah. You know, in the early stages. Which yeah, clearly. Oh, and man, and well. the fact that there was no telephone communication. When you think about today, how, you know, everyone would have been wired with the Internet. There would have been lots of communication. And, you know, that's something that Schlossberg would have thought was phenomenal. Right. The, the more communication, the better. All right. Before we say good night. But, but one last one last comment I yeah. want to make. This is why there was easy for Jerry, uh, Jerry to get them out of the store. They were never tied up. They were never restrained. Right. It was his the, idea to take them up. Take to the, them to the but, roof. Right. Yeah. Because, because yeah. if they, that's true, if they had been tied up, it wouldn't have been possible. All right. right. Before we say good night to Schwab and Stefan. Uh, one or two quick announcements, and then I'll say good night. Let's see, what do we have? Uh, we have a bunch of events coming up, but I don't think we're announcing them yet. That's a very good reason to go to folks.org and to sign up for our email list so you'll know we've got a few <laughs> events coming up this month. Uh, okay. And of course, throughout all throughout the uh, uh, pandemic, we know that we've become your favorite charity. Uh, we haven't charged tickets for folks' events as we went virtual. So keep us in your thoughts and in your charitable giving. Um, the film opens on Friday. It's, it's uh, produced by IFC Films. It's called Hold Your Fire. Uh, IFC has been a great partner for folks, so we love they make great films. Stefan, this is a real, this is a treasure. I mean, this is really, I know you've made critically acclaimed films, but this one is really, really important. I know you know this, but as speaking as a law professor, this is a really, really important movie that does something that really, I don't know, can't think of another movie that has documentary or feature film. So you should be congratulated. I'm encouraging our audience to go watch the films. You can go to see it on streaming channels. Uh, Schweib, you are the right man and the right face for restorative justice. Uh, you. You, you really are. And I'm glad that this is how you've rededicated your life and your career. And I'm trust so me, I can make a lot of money doing other things, but <laughs> this this gives me more personal satisfaction to help to save lives, you know, and to help people to show people how to resolve conflicts without killing each other. So um, those, those this, are, that's those my are, calling. <laughs> those are your calling or your calling is great final words. Those are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, until next time, I'm Thane Rosenbaum for folks. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, right. guys.